All right, we're going to start there in verse number 30. And he went also into Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and he served with him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked on my, upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name is called Levi. The sermon is called, How to Win Over a Husband That Hates You. How to Win Over a Husband That Hates You. Oftentimes I get phone calls and I've dealt with people in this church, people in other churches and just around the, the country. And oftentimes women will say things like, my husband hates me. He doesn't treat me right. He doesn't touch me. He doesn't love me. He doesn't want to be with me. He doesn't want to spend time with me. He try, looks for every reason to not be with me and, and, and hang out with me. And I often ask them, and they often follow that up with, I'm, I've done everything that I could possibly think of to make them love me. I just can't make my husband love me. And I look at the story of Leah, and the Bible's clear that Jacob hated Leah. He didn't want to marry her. It's not, he, he literally married the wrong woman. He never loved her. He never wanted to be with her, yet she loved him. And because she loved him, she spent the rest of her life winning back Jake, winning over Jacob's love in the first place. And we're going to go over some principles and some things that ladies can do to win the love of their husband, to win the affection, to win the heart of their husband when they perceive that their husband hates them. And, and maybe not all these things will apply to every single, you know, every lady in here for sure. And hopefully they never apply. But it is something that's it's very, very common. And so I feel like it's a very serious sermon I feel like it's something that can definitely help people. But let me just start it off by saying this. Go to Genesis chapter 49. Every wife can win her husband's heart back to her. Let me say that again. Every single wife can win over their husband's heart back to them again. This is not a sermon to correct the husbands. This is not a sermon to rebuke the husbands. That sermon will come maybe next week or some other time. This is a sermon to help you if your husband does not treat you right. If your husband is acting like a bad husband or even if you just have a bad husband, this will help you to win them over because I believe it is not only possible, I think it's extremely possible to do so. The Bible says in Genesis 3.16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. The women have a desire for their husband to desire them. They want their husbands to lead them. They want their husbands to rule over them. And when the husband is falling short in that area, or when he's just a bad husband, it throws things in disarray. And oftentimes women will do the wrong things and go about it the wrong way to try to win their husband. I've done everything. I've done this and I've done that, or I say this, or I say that, or I go, I do this or that, and it's not working. Well, let me tell you this. If you're doing something and it's not working, don't continue to keep doing it and getting the failed response. Do the right thing, and, I, and I, we're going to go over that, and you can win over your husband. Like the, A woman's desire is naturally going to be towards her husband. She wants him to care about her. A wife wants her husband to be affectionate and, and love her and say and be, spend time with her and, and actually be interested in her. When a husband is acting like a bad husband, oftentimes women do the wrong thing to win their husband over and they end up driving him away, driving him even farther. Now, go to you're in Genesis 49. Let me see this. People have this idea and it's a, it's a misapplied, I don't believe it's true, where they'll say, you know, women are impossible to understand and they'll say that men are just really easy. Well, if men are so easy to understand, how come every time people's marriages start to fall apart, the women don't know what to do to win him back over? If they knew if it was so easy, then it would just be a snap, right? 
I believe both of them. I don't think that either one of them it's impossible to understand. I believe the answers are in the word of God, but we just need to apply them to the Bible. We can look at Leah and we see, I mean, it's, a, it's five verses, but you got to realize those five verses span years. She's having one child and then another child and then another child. You can see that she's being persistent. She's not losing hope. She's staying focused and her goal, her mission in life is to win her husband. It's not just to have like a business relationship. It's not just to be tolerated. It's just, it's not just to not fight. Her goal, her whole mission is to win her husband, to make him love her and want to be with her. Now look at Genesis 49 verse number 29. She succeeds. She succeeds. I believe she succeeded in doing so. Look at verse 29. At the end, bury Leah and, and he was deciding where he was going to be buried. He desired to be buried next to Leah, not next to Rachel. Look at verse 29. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Look at verse 31. And there, there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. And there they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. I believe that at the end of their life, Jacob loved Leah more than Rachel. I believe that. Now, it might not be true. Whatever. I believe that he had very little love for her and just stayed married to her because he knew it was the right thing to do because he was a godly man. Divorce was not an option. But I believe at the end of their life, they had a good relationship. And I believe that Jacob loved Leah. And it wasn't because of anything Jacob done. It's because Leah was on a mission to win over her husband's affection. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter 3, and keep your finger there because we're going to come back and forth there. But I'm going to give you guys some principles on how to be, how to win over your husband back to you so that way you can get him to, lo to love you again. Now, let me say this. Leah and Jacob's marriage was never supposed to happen in the first place. I mean, it just, he literally was tricked into marrying the wrong woman. Now, she never, ever had Jacob's heart. Every wife in here, every wife, at one time at least, you had your husband's heart. Maybe your marriage got bad or maybe bad things happened and maybe you lost it for a short time. But you had it once, you can get it again. I believe that. I believe if you stay positive and you just trust the Lord, you trust the word of God, and you do what the Bible says... I believe that any wife can win over back over any husband. Now it may take year. It took Leah years and it may take, you know, you a long time, but I believe that it's a hundred percent possible. I believe that as long as you stay focused on the mission, it will happen. Look at first Peter three, verse one, likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word. So even if you have a husband, that doesn't even obey the Bible. He doesn't even really care about the things of God. They may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So right there, the Bible says that a godly woman can win over even an ungodly husband. If she just keeps the, the chaste conversation, if she keeps a lifestyle that is centered around the word of God, she can do it. Go to Genesis chapter number 30 and we'll get into the, we'll get into the points now. Good marriages are not accidental, and they're not due to finding your soulmate. That is a lie. People have this idea that if they don't find their soulmate, and they, they have a bad marriage, and then they, their marriage is on the rocks just because they, they married the wrong one. Well, Leah wasn't going to take, I married the wrong person as, a, as an answer. She said, look, I'm married to him. I know I can win him. I know the Lord wants the husband to desire the wife. I know the Lord wants the husband to rule over the wife. The Lord wants the husband to be a good husband. And he wants the wife to be a good wife. He wants to bless that, that relationship. And if one of them has decided, I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what the Bible says. I believe that she can win him over because I think the Lord will bless that. Okay? Now, the things that ladies do to win over their husbands oftentimes is the opposite of what the Bible says to do. Therefore, the Lord does not bless it. And therefore, he, she ends up driving him farther away. It's not right. I'm not sticking up for the guy. I'm saying that's, that's what happens. Look at point number one about how to win your husband back that hates you is don't be a nag. 
Don't be a nag. Now, that seems real simple, but I'll get into some ways that women that want their husbands to do things for them, not buy them stuff, not take them places, but just love them, how they will nag him away from them. Now, what does it mean to nag? Dictionary.com says to annoy by persistent fault fighting, like finding and faults in people, complaints or demands. To keep in a state of troubled awareness or anxiety as a recurrent pain or problem. To find fault or complain in an irritating, wearisome, or relentless manner. Okay? Now look at Genesis 30, verse number 1. So we have Leah, who was hated. We have Rachel, who was loved. So Jacob loved Rachel. He worked for years and years to marry Rachel. But look what she did. She was not, she, the Bible says she was barren. She couldn't have children. Look at verse number one. When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld thee from the fruit of the womb? So when she came to Jacob and she started nagging him and saying, Give me children or else I die. It actually caused Jacob not to love her, not to have compassion. It actually caused him to be angry with her. Because when people, when ladies nag their husbands, it causes him to do the opposite of whatever you say. Just like your children. Your children want to do something. You say, let me think about it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And they just nag you and they nag you. Guess what? The answer turns to no. The answer goes from maybe to no way. Because of a constant state of nagging, it causes people to want to rebel against what the person is telling them, you're in Genesis 30, go to 2 Samuel chapter number 6. 2 Samuel 6. Rachel made her husband angry because she was trying to blame him for something that was not in his power. Now, let me say this. A nagging wife is something that's talked about in the book of Proverbs quite a bit. I'll read some verses. A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. A contentious woman it's not, they are just continually contentious. They're continually an act, just every single day. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Just drops, just nag this, nag that, anger this, angry that, criticizing this, criticizing that. It drives, it'll, you're driving a bunch. You are not going to get what you want from your husband by nagging him. Now go to 2 Samuel chapter number 6. And I'll read this for you. People say that, ladies have said this. I just want my husband to be affectionate towards me. I just want him to, to kiss me. I want him to hug me. I want him to, I want him to be with me. And so I'll, they'll literally, they'll nag their husband. They'll criticize how their husband is not doing what he needs to do. And they will nag him. And instead of that making him want to like be with her and, and, and be affectionate with her, it actually repulses him. It actually makes him weary. I'm going to read this for you. In Luke 18, 3, this, this is the story of the unjust judge. There was a widow in that city. She came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary, for he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. When you're going to your husband and you just nag him to do stuff, he'll end up doing it just to shut you up. He'll end up doing it just to get you off his back. You will weary him down. You will trouble him. But that is not what you want. You want your husband to love you and to want to be with you because he loves you and he wants to be with you, not just to get you off his back. That's the goal that you should have in your mind. You're not trying to trouble and weary your husband and, and break him down into submission. It will not happen. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse number 16. Be thankful. Don't be a whiner. Be thankful. Don't be a whiner. Don't complain. Don't criticize. You are not to rebuke your husband. You rebuke your husband about something. It doesn't work. I've never seen in a relationship where wife and husband are fighting and she rebukes him and he's like, you know what? You know, and it doesn't happen. Why? Because it's repulsive. His desire, his, his, it's in him to rule over his wife. When she's usurping his authority, it causes him to rebel against that and to shut down. Look at verse number 16. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. 
So she sees David. He gets back from war. He doesn't come see her. He's out there dancing. He's out there doing whatever. She wants him to be with her, but he's not. So she despises him in her heart. Look at verse number 20. Then David returned to bless his household. He's coming in with a good attitude. He's actually showing up happy to be home. He's going to bless his household. Look at this. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. She couldn't even wait for him to get come inside. She like met him in the front yard. You know, look at what she says. How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself the day of a, today in the eyes of the, the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. So she starts to criticize what he's doing. Look at verse 21. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play before the Lord. Look, so he starts to argue back. He comes home and think, expecting to be well received, expecting to be wanted there. And then she comes out getting mad at him with an angry countenance. Look at verse number 22. This is his response. I will yet be more vile than this. So did it work? Did what she did work? No, it actually caused the opposite reaction. She wanted him to be with her. She came out there mad. She came out there angry buking and it caused him to say, you know what? I'll even, be, I'll even treat you even worse. And look, at, let's keep reading. Then thus, and I will be base in mine own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. No children. No physical relationship. Much less him coming home to bless his household. At that point, he probably bought her a house and said, yeah, you go live over there by yourself. And it did not work. She lived as a bitter, miserable person. Later on in the story, she's taking care of some guy from previous relationships' kids. And when it came time to, 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 to offer up some children of the household of Saul, he picked those five kids to go to, go, to be put to death. I bet it had something to do with like, okay, I'm going to be more vile. I remember when you were sitting there running your mouth, I'm going to make sure these, these kids you're taking care of, I'm going to take them from you and, and, and punish them. Go, go to your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3 again. Michael despised her husband and she ended up destroying her marriage. Fighting and insulting your husband will never cause him to care more about you. If your husband, if every single day you're just criticizing, you're nagging, even if it's like you, the desire, your end goal is for him to do right and for him to love you and, to, and all these things and take care of you, even if that's your goal, if you're, if you're trying to get there by nagging and complaining, it will never, ever work. Zero times. Never work. If they ever do cave in and say, okay, well, let's do this, let's do that, it's only going to be to make you be quiet, to get off their back. It's because they don't want to fight with you. They don't want the continual dropping. So instead of going and sitting on the corner of the housetop, they'll say, okay, whatever. What do you, you want to do? You want your husband to lead. You want your husband to rule over you. And you want him to do it with joy. You want him to be with you because he wants to, not because he has to. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Point number one is don't be a nag. You need to tell him every... Let me say this. I know life is hard. I know having children, whether it's one or eight, can be tough. Okay? I know that you have hard days. And even if you're in a time of your life where every day seems like it's a hard day, if every single day, the only time that your husband speaks with you, it's just... I'm having a bad day this, the kids are being bad there, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, I'm stressed out, and this, that. And it's just every single day, you're going to wear him down. He's going to be pulling up from work, and he's going to be thinking, now I got to go, he's got he's to psych himself up to go in. Because he's going to be thinking, I got to go in there, she's going to be, you know, the, the house is going to be a mess, she's going to be, you know, going bonkers, the kids, you know, it's just, if he's picturing what she's saying. And he's going to, it's not going to make him want to come home. Okay. You want him to want to come home. Not only that, if you complain and you nag about certain things, it's almost like the little boy that cried wolf. You know, it almost comes to where like, it's not as weighty. If it's just always every day, it's just a bad day. It's almost kind of like he'll almost stop caring and become dull to it because it's like, well, every day is a bad day with you. That's the way it comes. Now, if you never complain, you never nag. When you call up and say, I'm having a rough time, do you know what he's going to say? What can I do? How can I help? But when it's every single day, he's going to become tired of it. Yeah. He's not going to respond to you. Look down at 1 Peter 3, verse number 1. 
number point number two is seek to happily and joyfully please your husband happy and joyfully please your husband how do i get him to love me and care about me look at verse number one we're going to read these six verses likewise you wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives it says they're supposed to be in subjection to their husbands while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear who's adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair or wearing of gold or putting on of apparel but let him be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit in which is in the sight of god a great price after this manner the old time the holy women also who trusted in god adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So we have right here a contrast. Look, you should be have your the 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 the, in, the inward man walking in the spirit should be an ornament. An ornament is something that you see. Your husband should be beholding your chaste conversation. He should be beholding your meek and quiet spirit. He should be able to see that you're in subjection. The Bible says that will win him over. So you have two choices here. You have the one where it's just, you know, like the trophy wife where just, you know, it is always dolled up, always everything over here. But she's a nag. But she's a complainer. But she's a criticizer. She's always angry. She's always mad. It's always bad. It's never good. It's always a dark cloud. And then you have a lady over here that maybe someday she doesn't do everything, you know, it's... She's more important. She's more driven by trying to serve the Lord, love the Lord, love her husband. But her countenance is, is, is goodly. She's happy. She's, she's joyful. She's got meek and quiet, which means that she's walking in the spirit, which you can see all over her countenance. You can see love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Out of her mouth cometh the law of kindness. That's what you see. Look, any guy is going to choose this any day of the week. Yeah. Now, on to the next point, just because that's true doesn't mean you shouldn't worry about the physical appearance. You have to make yourself uh, the appearance. You should care about your appearance and wear things that he likes. Go to Genesis chapter 30. Keep your finger in 1 Peter 3 because we're going to come back. Genesis chapter number 30. He will choose. He would rather come home and maybe the hair is not done perfectly or whatever is not done just exactly perfect. But you be joyful, happy, in a good mood, wanting him to be there. Then you just be just decked out in the, you know, costly array, just, you know, looking just perfect. But you're just angry and you're a nag. Look, the angry and a nag is a turnoff. Nobody wants that. Now... <clears throat> You say, how am I going to make myself presentable? Like, what about my appearance should be, you know, taken care of? Well, wear stuff that he likes. If your husband likes things a certain way, do that. You say, I don't know how my husband wants me to dress. Ask him. Say, what do you like? What don't you like? What do I wear that you don't like? And then when he says it, just get rid of it and don't wear it. Was it ask him, say, hey, how do you like my hair? Just ask him. Say, how do you like my hair? How do you like this? How do you want this done? And then do it happily and joyfully do it because you love him you're trying remember you're trying to win over somebody that you're perceiving is showing the signs of him hating you okay now um, smile make him want you don't be a grouch and frown all the time that's the truth you gotta smile you gotta smile if you don't smile if you never smile look the first thing your husband should see when he walks in the door is a smiling wife she had a hard day. She had a rough day. You know, you know what time your husband comes home. He say, he comes home at six o'clock. Look at five thirty. Doesn't matter how rough of a day you had. Run, fix your hair. You know, put on your apron or whatever you want to do. And then when he walks in the door, be ready with a smile. You say, I'm sick. I don't feel good. Or I've had a hard day. Look, how bad do you want to win over your husband? How bad do you want it? Look, Leah was somebody that was continually rejected for years. And she just kept focused. Every child, you know what? Now he's going to love me. Now he's going to be joined unto me. Now he's going to love me. And it didn't stop after the third and fourth child. 
Look at this right here. Look at Genesis 30. Look at verse number 14. Make sure that your husband knows he is priority above all else. Your husband is priority over the children. Your husband is priority over Facebook. Your husband is priority. Look, when you are, let me just say this before we get there. When, you're, when your husband gets home, he needs to be the priority over everything. Which means this, when he gets home, turn the phone off. Turn the Facebook off. Yeah. Turn all the stuff off. So that way you can pay attention to your husband. So that way he knows that you have, you, every lady wants their husband to pay attention to them, but they don't do the same thing in return. Now look down at verse number 14. And Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. So Reuben's already grown up a little bit and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, give me, I pray thee, thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, is it a small matter that thou hast taken also, that thou hast taken my husband? And wouldest thou take away my husband's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. So there, Reuben finds these mandrakes. They must be pretty good. I don't know. I, I don't even know what a mandrake is, to be honest with you. I, I looked it up and I forgot. And Rachel says, hey, I want your son's mandrakes. And she's like, oh, you're going to take our, my kid's food. You already took my husband. And Leah says, look, I'll let you be with Jacob tonight if you give me the mandrakes. And she's like, deal. You know, she gives it one of those. Look at verse number 16. And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him, just like Michael went out to meet David. But look, this is the opposite. And said, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. You know what she said? She came out and she said, I want to be with you. She came out there. She, probably, she said, look, her goal was to be with Jacob. She was trying to win him over. And she met him out there. She was willing to sacrifice the needs of her son, the wants of her son, to make sure that he was the priority in her life. She could have said, no, these are my son's mandrakes. You just go be a jerk. He don't even like me anyway. You know, uh, she didn't get this nag, but she didn't do that. Go in your Bibles to, go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3. Leah had a need to be with Jacob, and then it meant her children's needs and wants had to take a back seat. Which means this. Ladies all the time, they'll say like, well, I would, you know, get dressed up for my husband. I would do this for my husband, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy taking care of his kids. Look, the priorities are backwards. Look, you're a wife. Your priority is obviously the Lord, is, is God himself. But number two, and far too, I believe, above your children is your spouse, is your husband. I believe that. My wife has ultimate priority in my life over my children. I believe that because when, the, when they get old and they, they go off and marry and it's just going to be me and my wife again. And then I come to her and say, yeah, I know I put my children above you this whole, this last 25 years. Now let's have a good relationship. It's not going to happen. You got to, you got to put your priorities where the Bible says to put your priorities. And as a wife, your husband has priority over your children and his wants are priority over your children's wants. Put your husband before your children always. When your husband is speaking, if a child comes up and interrupts, say, your dad is talking right now. He needs to know that he has priority in your life and that what he is saying is what you want to hear with joy and with happiness. Next point, happily and joyfully submit in everything, every time. Happily and joyfully submit in everything, every time. Now, obviously, if he wants you to commit sin, you don't commit sin, okay? We ought to be God rather than men. However, when he tells you to do something you don't want to do, you do it happily and joyfully. If you are doing what he says just because you have to, just because you know that you're supposed to, look, that's not full obedience. You want to... Do, this is the love of God that when he keeps his commandments, his commandments are not grievous. The same thing when it goes to your husband and wife. Look, this is the love that you show towards your husband is that you obey his commandments and his commandments, they're not grievous. He gets no lip from you. He gets no angry face. He gets no sighing. He gets no, okay. You know, he, he should feel when he tells you to do something that you want to do it and it's a good decision. You say, well, my husband doesn't make good decisions. It doesn't matter. The Bible says 
in Ephesians 5, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in what? In everything. Submit happily and joyfully in everything, every time, every situation. Because there's a lot of times where the church is supposed to be subject unto Christ, right? And what do a lot of churches do? Say, well, I know the Bible says that, but I, don't, I think that this is a better way. And we say, no, we're subject unto Christ in everything, in every situation, every time. Even if it's far beyond, like, well, I just think it doesn't matter what you think. Right. And you as a wife, you look at the things that your husband tells you to do or wants you to do. It doesn't matter how silly you think it is. It doesn't matter if you think it's the wrong decision. You're subject unto your husband, everything, every time. Now, this is a sermon that flies in the face of all out there. Exactly. But I'm telling you what, do you want to win your husband over? Look, the world is, is getting divorced at, at, at alarming rates. And they're, they're just... The marriages are lasting just overnight and people are getting divorced. So what they're doing is wrong. And if they hate this preaching, that's fine. They're going to go, they're married. They're going to be these people that are married five, six times, but not you. You have to decide that who you're married to right now, you're going to be married to them. And not only that, you as a wife, if you desire to be loved by your husband, this is what you're going to have to do. Happily and joyfully submit. Look at verse number four. Right, you guys go first Peter chapter three. Let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner of old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well. How would they do well? What's the doing well that would make you like a daughter of Sarah? Obeying your husband calling him Lord. You say, should I call my husband Lord? If you want to. Say, that's silly. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. Now this today equivalent would be like, sir. Yes, dear. Yes, sir. How you address your husband in your heart shows a lot whether you despise him or whether you love him. And look, if you're despising him, if you're angry at him for the way he's treating you, it will come out and it will not work. You have to, it's a heart problem. And you can't just change him. You can't just flip a switch and make him do what you want. You have to change yourself. And you have to pray and say, God, please, I'm so bitter at my husband. I've got, I despise my husband. He's treated me so bad. I want him to love me and he doesn't. And, everything I and you have to pray and say, God, please change my heart towards my husband. Help me to love my husband even when he's not loving me first. You have to win him over. The Bible says we are to love people like Christ loved us. Who loved, who, who loved first, us or, or God? God. We love him because what? He first loved us. He was willing to take that step and say, look, for God's love, he gave his only begotten son. If you want your husband to love you, you got to love first. Even if you know, look, the Lord knows that, that the majority was going to reject. He did it anyway. He still showed that love. Look, you say, well, I'm going to try, but he's going to, it's just, he's going to reject me. He's going to keep treating me bad. You just keep on and keep on and keep on happily and joyfully serving and submitting to your husband. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You say, why do you need to read that? Well, you need to listen when he speaks. You need to listen and be interested in what he's talking about. If your husband wants to come home and talk about work, act like you care. You have no idea what he's talking about. You know, you come home, and I remember coming and telling my wife solar stories, you know. Like, we're doing this, and we're lagging this bolt in, and this and that. And I went to go knock this thing, and I actually punctured a hole in the roof somehow. Like, I don't know how. Like, and, I'm, and she's just like, oh. And you know, you know what she's thinking? I have no idea. I can't even picture what you're talking about. Oh, okay, cool. That's, that's good, right? Or bad? You know, like, <laughs> they don't know. Yeah. Act interested in what he's interested in. You know, obviously, if it's not ungodly, no, you know, we understand that. But at the same time, he wants to talk about work. He wants to talk about other things. Look, act like you're interested in what you want to invest. You want to sow, right? You want to reap, right? You want him, you want to reap love and affection. You want to reap him caring and being interested in, in you and what you're interested in. You need to sow that into him. Now, when you sow seed, it doesn't, you don't reap right away. It doesn't just like you sow a seed and then the next day it comes out. I remember one time I knew a guy that said that 
he uh, he said peanut butter will make your hair grow. I remember him telling me that. I'm like, what? And he's he was a weird guy, and he was talking about how like one time he was in his house and he just there's a bunch of like you know you know what's like government peanut butter. You know what I'm talking about? It's like really hard. You know like it's like you'll just like ruin like ten loaves of bread to make three sandwiches. And he said he had this peanut butter and he said he was just really hungry and he ate he just ate like cans and cans of peanut butter for like three days and he said his hair grew like four four inches in like three days and he was serious we're just like you're out to lunch man there's no way so you can't just eat peanut butter and the next day your hair grows it's, it's a lot you can't just sow a seed and then reap the next day it takes time especially if your relationship has been bad for a while it's not going to be fixed overnight it's going to take time you're going to have to go out there nothing sprung up keep watering you have to go back out there. Nothing sprung up. Keep watering. Then you're going to have to do that. Leah did it for years. You say, well, I, I've been doing it. I, I'm going to try it. And if it don't work by the end of the week, I'm going to go back to being a nag. <laughs> well, then you need to go back and re-listen to the sermon. <laughs> you know, let me say this. Your husband does not have to earn your submission. Your husband does not have to earn your submission. He doesn't have to earn you submitting to him. He receives that when you got married to him. Amen. Okay? Women have this idea that if their husband's a bad husband, they don't have to submit. Well, if he's not doing what he needs to do, then I don't have to do what I need to do. That's foolish. Let's, 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 let's translate to your children. What if your children were honest and told you, well, you don't submit to dad. Why do I have to submit to you? Yeah. Say, no, no, no. And he said, well, mom, dad, you have to earn me obeying you. Show me why. You'd say that's ridiculous. Well, the same thing applies in every level of authority. Your husband, when you said I do, said, when did he earn it? When you said I do. He put that ring on, you accepted it, and said, I do too. That's when he earned your submission. Your job is to do what God told you to do. His job is to do what God told him to do. But if he's not doing it, don't let it sidetrack you from doing what God, God's will is for your life. And God's will, without question, is for you to submit to your husband. Look down at, you guys are in, where do you have you guys go? Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Listen, even if you want to speak, especially if, you're, if, you're, if, it's a, if it's a submission issue, and he's telling you to do something, you don't have to chime in with like, well, I think that this is a better way. No, that's not submission. I did electrical work, and oftentimes when they hire somebody that's just brand new to electrical work, they, it's called an apprentice, but most of the time they'll say, oh, I hired a new helper. Now imagine if you hired a helper, and every time you told the helper to do something for you, or do something in a certain way, well, you know what, I think... I think it should be done this way. Or did you know what? I've seen somebody say or somebody else in a different company, they did it this other way. That's not a good helper. You get yourself fired that way. Because they hired you to help. They didn't hire a supervisor. Look, you're not the supervisor. You're not, if you are constantly trying to, you cannot lead and submit at the same time. If you're trying to lead your husband, you're not submissive. That's not what submissive is. Now, look down. You guys are there? Let me say this. Seeking his wisdom. You should seek his wisdom and his protection in decision making. If your husband makes a decision, go with it. If he wants to do a certain thing, just go with it. Joyfully and happily. You say, what if he's making the bad decision? What if he's making the wrong decision? When you're the helper at work, sometimes... I've been on jobs where the, the, I knew the guy that was a supervisor told us to do a certain thing, and I thought to myself, he's going to get us all, all, all messed up. Like he's going he's, he's gonna to mess up the wiring right now. And then later on, we have to fix it. But because I was a good employee, I said, yes, sir. And I just looked at it like he's giving us job, and job assurance. You know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> probably get overtime now because they're going to have a guy here fixing this thing late. Men learn better by failing than they do by being corrected by their wife. If a guy makes the wrong decision, he fails. We learn the hard way. Oftentimes we kind of have to learn the hard way. This is like a thing that guys do. 
But definitely, most guys will learn off their past mistakes. And if you let your husband fail, you try to help in certain areas, but if you're always correcting every time he makes a decision, you're always correcting him, you are doing him a disservice. You are not helping him. You're actually trying to lead, and if you're trying to lead your husband, you're not being a helper. Where am I at here? He makes bad decisions. Well, God blesses when things are done according to his plan and his structure. When your husband makes a decision and you follow him, the Lord can bless the decision, even if it's not the right decision. Even if the Lord can see that it's going to be a failure at the end, he can come and, and, and help things to be fixed in the end. Because he knows you and he loves you and he, he wants to bless you in your actions of submitting to your husband. Let your husband make decisions. He's the boss. He will learn how to lead better if you support him when he fails. So he makes a decision. Hey, you know what? I think we're going to do this certain thing financially. And you're thinking, man, I, I just, I don't know. Happily, joyfully submit. Let's say he fails and he does something wrong and the electricity gets shut off. The water gets shut off. Look, he will learn from that mistake. What he doesn't need is a, I told you so, or I knew this wasn't going to work. Are you criticizing him and complaining and nagging him and throwing it in his face? You know what he needs is, hey, how can we get this? Is there anything I can do? Is there, is that, that's what he needs you to do. Yeah. He will learn from his mistakes. Now, asking your husband what you can do for him instead of always asking him what he can do for you. Ask your husband. Say, hey, what would you like to eat? What would you like this? How would you like me to do this? What do you like? And then do it. I know this sounds like a, you know, like a husband, like this very self-serving sermon. But I mean, I'm telling you, look, this will work I, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's what the Bible says. Submission in everything. Don't look at where you guys at. Let me keep going. I know I had you go to Ephesians 4. We'll get there in a second. I don't want to, I don't want to skip any of these things. Don't be argumentative. Don't argue with him. Stop. Submit. We're talking about a, a bad husband. A bad husband makes bad decisions. They usually make bad spiritual decisions. They usually just, it just is what it is. He hates you. If you want him to love you and you want him to start being won over, you cannot be argumentative. What do I do when I know he's making the wrong decisions? Well, sometimes it's best not to say anything at all and just submit. Look, again, don't be argumentative. Don't be criticizing and arguing with him, especially if it's every single time. Because what you're doing is you're nullifying your opinion. See, my opinion doesn't matter to my husband. Yeah, because he's always hearing it. There's no weight to it. There's no value to it. Because you're always, there's just always something. Now, if you rarely ever interject, and then he goes to make a decision, you're like, you know, I don't think that's the right decision. I think, what do you think if we do this? You know what he's going to say? You know, maybe you're right. But when it's every time he makes a decision, you're always usurping his authority. You're always using it as a reason to try to lead him in a different direction. You know what? It's not going to be as weighty to him. He's not going to care what you think. And you want him to care what you think. You want him to value your, your opinion. But it's not going to happen if you're always throwing it in his face. He's going to rebel. He's going to reject. An attribute of a good leader is that they're decisive. As a man, if you want to be a good leader, you have to be decisive. You have to make the right decisions. And if every time you're, and you want, you want your husband to rule over you, you want him to be a good husband. It means that you want him to be a good leader. But every time he makes a decision, you cast shade on it and you cast doubt. Do you know what that makes him? That actually drives him to be more indecisive. You're actually making him an even worse leader. You want him to make decisions and then go with it. And then, Lord willing, it'll all work out. But if he ends up making... Look, I remember one time, that I was in a church where, a long time ago, there was a guy, and this guy was a loser. This guy had so many jobs, and, and I'm really good. I don't, I don't know how this guy got the jobs he did. He, had, he showed me his resume and he didn't pay more than 20 bucks an hour. I'm like, how do you get all these jobs? Doesn't anybody look at your resume? Like you're literally going for job to job every two weeks, three weeks. And he ended up, he never paid the bills. He always messed things up financially. And his wife got told by the pastor, just leave him. No. I, I think if your husband is going to drive you into homelessness, you make him watch you and all the kids go with him. 
you're a team. And I feel like if anybody ever says separate for any reason, it's, it's bad advice. Yeah. It's bad advice. He needs to understand his decisions affect everybody. And he needs to know, look, if he's going to make a bad decision and the lights get shut off, we're all going to be, lights are going to be shut off. Don't be a nag. Don't be a complainer. Don't be argumentative. Look, stop asking for something then complaining about it when you get it. Oh, I wish my husband would. I wish we could. We never have any money. You know, we, we never can pay the bills. And then your husband goes to work. And then maybe he has to work on a church service day. Or he has to work a little bit more hours to provide. And then you start complaining and crying about that. Look, some people just need to be content with such things as they have. Yeah. And if you have a guy that's willing to go out there and work hard, look, a lot of times guys don't have any special skills. Any sp they don't have a whole lot of options. They got to take what they can get. And if that job that they can get for the, for the, for the, for the moment that they're in is, you know what, we're going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to work on Sunday nights. I'm going to have to work on Wednesday nights. But I'll be able to provide. Stop being a crybaby and just accept it. And say, you know what, I, I'm just glad that you work. I love you. Pray to God, submit. How are you going to expect God to hear your prayers when out of one side of your mouth, you're talking about how much you love the Lord, and then the next side of your mouth, you're criticizing your husband in your heart? Yeah. You want the Lord to bless. At the end of 1 Peter 3, it talks about that the Lord shall be open and attend to their prayers. The Bible says that we should love our, our wives and our husbands, have a good relationship, that our prayers are not hindered. If you have despite towards your husband and you have all this contention and bitterness towards your husband, the Lord is not going to hear your prayers. If you are loving your husband, you have a pure heart and you're doing it with joy and you are taking responsibility for yourself and saying, look, I know he's making that, but you're praying for your husband and you are doing right, the Lord will hear your prayers. And that's what he'll bless. He doesn't bless rebellion. Yeah. And being bitter and being argumentative is rebellion. He is your authority. Now, the Bible says every wise woman Buildeth their house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. You have two options most of the time, ladies. You can think you're right in an argument, or you can have a good marriage. You got to decide. Some ladies are willing to tear their entire household down and apart, just so that way their husband will agree they're right. And let me tell you this. If you've been arguing with your husband for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, an hour, and then he says you're right, do you know what he's saying? Let me translate that. Your right means shut up. I'm not joking. He's doing you know singing. I'm done. I'm not here to waste time. I'm not here to waste my breath. Okay, yeah, you know what? You're right. No. He should say you're right because you're right. But if you're always just nagging, if you're always argumentative, and you just want to be right, you know what? You're not going to have a good marriage. You have to be willing to know, to think you're right, but he doesn't have to think that. You can say, you know what? He can think he's right. Let's have a good marriage. You don't have to sit there and be a contentious person. Go to, if you go to Ephesians 4, verse number 26. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 26. You're there to help him, not to lead him. You're a help meet for him. You're not a leader for him. You need to get that out of your head and say, well, I'm more spiritual. I'm more responsible. It doesn't matter. Right. He's the God-given authority over you in your life. If you don't like that, then get used to having a bad marriage. If you don't like that, get used to him never wanting to be around you. If you don't like that, get used to him being mean to you. If you don't like that, then get used to him not wanting to be with you. But if you want to win him over, you got to say, do you know what? Me being right doesn't matter. It's fine. I'm going to happily and joyfully love my husband. Look at verse number 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to who? The devil. So the devil is out to attack your family. He's out to attack your marriage. And the way he's going to do that is he's going to attack with bitterness. He's going to attack with causing you to want to despise your husband. All these type of things. Look at verse number 29. So how do we do that? How do we not give place to the devil? How do we get angry but sin not? Well, look at verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. 
And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speakings be put away from among you with all malice. And be kind to one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Forgive and forget wrongdoings and shortcomings and get them out of your mind. It says right there, put the, all bitterness and all anger and wrath is be put away from, uh, from you. Putting, oh, if a guy puts his wife away or a wife puts her husband away, that means he's divorcing her. That means he's saying, I don't want nothing to do with you, right? The Bible says bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, mean, they should be put away from, him, from among you. Your husband does something wrong. He does something to offend you. Let, by the end of the night, even, you should have, you should put it away from among you. It should have, not be there at all. Our love for each other, whether it be just as brethren, the Bible talks about loving each other as brethren. I'm talking about a husband and a wife. Look at the Song of Solomon. How many times he'll say, my love, my sister. It wasn't his physical sister in Christ. But he looked at her as somebody that we are. We have commonality on, on a lot of things. Not just I love you and I think you're beautiful and I want to be with you, but on other in other areas. He looked at her as a sister in Christ, and we should be treating each other as such. In the same way, the Bible says right there in Ephesians four thirty two, be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. How does God forgive us when we do wrong and we can? The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does cleanse mean? It means to clean up. So let's say, you know, I, I spilled great soda, I don't know, on the floor. And I cleansed the floor. And I said to you, I said, look, somewhere in this place, I spilled soda. He said, well, I don't see it anywhere. Where is it at? Well, I cleaned it up. That means that it's, nobody can say, look, where you spilled the soda like well it's not there i cleaned it up it's a common stereotype and i think it's a trap that women fall into where they're always bringing up old things you got in a fight a month ago a year ago he offended you he did wrong and he admitted it was wrong it should be over but every time you fight every time you argue and you feel like you're losing the battle and he's not admitting you're right what do you do you bring it up you're just, you're just looking, for, you're just trying, look, the next time you do that, say to yourself, I want to have a bad marriage. I want my husband to hate me. I don't want him to touch me. I don't want him to be around me. Because that's what you're showing when you do that. You're bringing up things that should be done and over with. If you're bringing up things that have, you say the sun go down to breath, if it's been past last night, it should not have, it should not even be brung up. You say, well, he don't, you don't know what he's done to me. It doesn't matter. If we confess our sins, the Bible says, he will cleanse us from all our... So, does God on this earth, he chastises, he punishes us, he, you know. But if we confess our sins, he'll forgive us. Only the little sins or the big sins too? All of them, right? That's right man. So, is the Lord just going to keep reminding us of the sin that we've done? No, it's cleansed. Clean. As a wife, you need to be able to... When he says he's sorry and he says, okay, I should have done that. I'm sorry for how I, you know, whatever. Done. It should not be bring up. If it gets bring up again, it's your sin, not his. It's not firepower. If you're doing that, you're not trying to have a good relationship. You're actually tearing down. The Bible says to you, to the, that which is good to the edifying. It's not building up. It's actually tearing down. And oftentimes it's out of spite. It's, you know, you're losing the battle. You know, he's... He, he thinks he's right. You think you're right. And he, he's making a better case for why he's right and not you. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to bring out all this evidence and just lay it on him. That is a trap. That is a snare from the devil. The Bible talks about that right there. He says, don't give place to the devil. Why? Anger, bitterness. Look, if you remember those things and they still affect you to where every time you get mad, you got to say it. Look, that's bitterness. That's a trap of Satan. Look at verse number seven. So contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him. And to comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Somehow, somebody be thrown at church. We can apply this to marriage. So he does something wrong. He screws up. He does something he shouldn't have done. He, he, does, he, does, he sins against you. 
Well, the Bible says you should forgive him. Why? Look at verse number 9. For to this end did I write that I may know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. <clears throat> to whom ye forgave anything, I also forg I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes I forgave it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage over us of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. You want the, do you want Satan to get an advantage on your marriage? Do you want him to get... What's an advantage mean? It means he's winning. You want your husband... You want, you want Satan to be winning in your marriage, then be bitter. Then be angry. Just bring it all up. You have to train yourself to forgive and to forget. If you're going to fight, it has to be about new things, not about old. Things that happen today. Go to, you guys in 2 Corinthians. Last place, go to Song of Solomon chapter 8. Bringing up Old mistakes cause us strife and not peace. It never works. If you're trying to beat your husband into submission, you're going to have a failing marriage. He is not going to be the leader. You want this goal for him. You got to decide. What do you want your husband to be? I want him to be a leader. I want him to love me. I want him to lead spiritually. I want him to lead physically. I want him to lead in every area. You have to be submissive spiritually, submissive physically, submissive in every area. How can you expect him to do something, his role, when you won't even do your role and you're supposed to be the self-proclaimed more spiritual one? You have to be somebody that's able to say, look, my spirituality is going to say I'm going to obey. I'm going to be obedient in all things. I'm going to be submissive in everything, every time, every circumstance. And I'm going to pray that if he makes a bad decision, that the Lord will bring us through it and that the Lord will show him. And eventually you can win them over. You say, well, when, he, when, he, when we argue, he just gets all quiet. He doesn't say nothing. It's like one side. It's just me. And then he just doesn't say nothing. He just looks down or he just sits there. You know why? It's because he doesn't want to waste his time. He knows arguing back and forth with you is not going to work. And therefore, why even bother? And then that translates to him. He stops caring about your marriage. Because he feels like, okay, this is just how we're going to live now. He starts settling in that. Where it's like... Okay, well, this is just how we live now. And he doesn't want to talk. If you argue with your husband and he doesn't want to, he just doesn't talk, it's because, it's because of you. It's because you just, you're, you're bombarding him. You're bombarding him with old stuff. You're bombarding him with new stuff. Look, he just wants you to shut up. I don't mean that in a rude way. I mean that seriously. If you're arguing and he just gets all quiet as heaven. It's because he just wants you to be, he just wants to be over with it. He doesn't want closure. He doesn't want this to be resolved. He's looking at it like it cannot be resolved with you right now. You're not, you're not reasonable. And since I can't reason with you and I can't resolve it, let's just get done with it so we can move on. How many relationship fights never come to like a, an end? They just stop. And then they just, be, they just go on like it didn't happen. Then it comes and resurfaces back up. Look, you need there to be healing. The Bible says, it is an honor for a man to cease from strife. But every fool will be meddling. If there comes a point where your husband says, you know, you're fighting about something, right? He was mean to you. And he, and he says, I'm sorry. Take it for what it's worth. People, that, women want that apology. And then when they get it, they don't believe it. It's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did that. No, you're not. It's like, well. I don't know what to tell you. You know, that's all I can say, you know? And then they don't believe it. The Bible says it's honorable. The honorable person will cease from strife. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Let's have some closure. It says a fool will be meddling. A fool is what's the... They're already in fight mode. They're already amped up. They're not going to let something as silly as forgiveness get in their way. But that's, that's how you have a bad marriage. Go to... Uh, so, yeah, so the Song of Solomon chapter 8. eight. Your goal is to cause closure. Your goal is to start the building process, right? And to start building the relationship, to start adding to it. You're to be a helper, not a leader. You're to be a helper, not a hindrance. Ask to speak to him about your differences and know when to take a break if it's getting escalated. You have to be able to... I remember when we first got married... We went and talked with our pastor, Pastor Barlamant, and he always told us about this fight nice. So you need to fight nice. If you guys get in a fight, that's okay. You just need to fight nice. 
obviously don't get physical, don't start throwing things, you know, don't get all, don't get, you know, like the kids say, cray cray, you know, <laughs> but, you know, fight nice. And then he told us some stories, and it's funny because a lot of times Baptist preachers put on this front, like they never have any problems in their marriage, everything's just always hunky-dory. And it gives people this irrealistic idea of what marriage is. And then when the, when the congregation starts having problems, they think, man, I'm very wicked. How come, you know, what's, what's wrong with us? You know, we're just so bad. But when you have a pastor that's what, ready to just to be, like, very transparent and say, look, I'm here. He told us he had problems. I remember one time he told us a story about him kicking in the door because his wife locked it. And, and he was just laughing about it. And he's like, we learned to fight nice. He's, and he didn't invent it. Somebody told him, you need to fight nice. And when it stops not being nice, and the fight needs to stop. And you have to not be driven by emotion. Now, ladies, oh, I'm all about, ladies have this like, people think ladies are more spiritual than men. They're not. They're more emotional than men. And emotion, emotionalism is not spirituality. That's right. 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 You cannot be driven. So that was me this. I'm mad. I can't hold it. I got to tell him. You have to be able to say, I know once I start talking, if he disagrees with me, it's going to make me more angry. It's going to make me more upset. And you need to say to yourself, when I get to this certain point, I'm going to say time out. Because I'll tell you what, if any lady is fighting with his, her husband and says, let's take a break, you know what he's going to say? Boom. <laughs> That's, I'll take a break. And then come back to it like adults, not like children, where it's just like, I have to be right and I have to be right. And look, Again, we're assuming that he's not going to accept it. We're assuming at first he's the bad husband. He's not spiritual. He's, so it's on you. It's your responsibility. You say, well, I, I, you know, I'm going to try it out. What if in a couple months his, his attitude toward me hasn't changed? We'll keep going. I don't know how long it was from the first child, from marriage, all the way till the next one, to the fifth one. But she always had it. Every time she had a baby, she thought, now he's going to love me. You know what? She was somebody that never, that, that's what she wanted. And it was always in her mind, I'm going to win my husband over to me. He will love me. He will care about me. Don't think that you need him. To, don't make him apologize for every single little infraction. Don't be so sensitive. You got to stop. And you got to say, look, he doesn't need to ap apologize for every single little thing. That's just a part of you being a knack. You need to be able to say, look, I'm gonna, if it's a big thing, you need to be able to make a difference between little things that don't matter that much. You need to be able to shrug them off. So that way when a big thing happens, you can go to him and say, hey, you offended me. You hurt my feelings. You did this or that. And you know what he'll say? Oh, I'm sorry. Because he's not just constantly hearing it. Yeah. Or it's going to be like, oh, it's, I'm always, you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's, it's always something with you. Every little thing I do. The Bible says about God, oh, Lord, if thou shouldest mark iniquities, oh, Lord, who should stand? If God required us to get on our knees every single time we committed any type of a sin, we would be constantly in prayer and we would still fail. Yeah. Yeah. If you expect your husband to apologize for every single little thing, do you know what? He's going to be constantly on his knees and he's going to still fail. That's an unrealistic expectation. Save the apology. Look, you got to realize that some things just aren't worth it. you got to weigh it. Me being right, good marriage. Him apologizing or me just, you say, you just want me to stuff it? Yes. Tell it to Jesus. It's a, if it's a small thing, look, keep the small things small. Big things, hey, if you have to tell them, let them know. But when it comes to small things, you need to, if you're always over every little infraction, you know what you are? You're like a helicopter wife. Who knows what a helicopter parent is? Like when the kids are just, they're just falling. Like, no, 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 no. They don't let them mess up. Let them just do that, and then they mess up, and you spank them. No, 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 no. It's, it's stressful. Sometimes you'll have wives that are like, every day I'm constantly telling them this or that or the other thing. And I'm like, that's your problem right there. He can't be that bad. You know, what is he just coming home, and he's just like, Whoosh. and then like, he's just, I mean, if, if you listen to these ladies, that's what you think their husband is like. I'm not saying he's a good guy, okay? But I'm saying this, he can't be that bad. If you're that easily offended, you need to check your heart. You need to get, make, do some little soul searching and say, you know what? If my husband does little things, I'm going to shrug it off. Do you know why? Because I want to have a good marriage. I want him to, to love me. You know, I want him 
to want to be with me. Don't be so sensitive. You should not be so easily offended. You need to be on a mission. A mission. To, and say, what if it takes 10 years? Then it takes 10 years. And you're, look, the Bible says that we shall reap if we don't faint. If we don't grow weary and we don't grow tired. Look, just know what your mission is. Know what the grand, the big picture is. The big picture is to win over your husband. Now, hopefully nobody in this church has a husband that hates them. But if there ever comes to a point where you start thinking, man, he just treats me bad. I feel like he hates me. This is how you win him back over. Look at Song of Solomon 8 and verse number 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contempt. You should be willing to say, you know what? Because I love him, no waters can, can, can quench it. Any storms of life are not going to put out my love for my husband. All the storms that he puts me through, all the things, the way he speaks to me, the way he treats me, I will not, I refuse to let that put out my love for my husband. I want to, 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 to give all my substance. I want to maybe a, a sacrifice to, to win him back over. I'm telling you what, it will work. There will be a day when your husband starts caring about you. Not because he has to, but because he wants to. And that's the goal, right? The Lord wants us to do things because we love him. We want our children to obey because they love us. And if your husband, you want him to do things with you and for you because he loves you and he wants to please you. I was just speaking with my wife today about a family member of mine. And this guy's a very hardworking guy. He's kind of like a cousin. And, and, and we're talking about him just being a really good guy. Like he's, he, I, I think he's saved. I think my, uh, my buddy Gabe got him saved, but he's just not a Christian like practicing. He's not really a godly man. But I said he's a hardworking dude. And she go, and he just, he loves his family. And he loves family in general. Like he adopted some kids that were family members that they just kind of, and, I, and, and my wife goes, I bet his wife gets everything she wants. And I said, I bet you so. Because we've, we've met them. I mean, we obviously met them. I grew up with the guy. But we met them. The way that they run, He's the head, just naturally. Like they're not even, she might not even be saved. I don't know, but she lets him lead. And because she lets him lead and she cares about him and submits to his authority, look, when things are done the Bible way, you get the Bible result. Yeah. And I guarantee, look, hey, honey, anything you want, I'll do it. Anything, I'll, you give me the, I'll sign the check, we'll buy you anything you want, and I'll go anywhere you want me to do because I love you, because I want to. Let me tell you this, if you're submissive to your husband and you love him and you just say, you know what, I value our marriage, I'm willing to give all my substance to have a good marriage for, our, for, the, for the love we have, for your love, you will get it. The Lord wants you to have a good marriage. If you follow these steps, I, I truly believe you can, you can change and you can win over your husband's heart. Let's pray.